Hey, physics, welcome to another awesome flipped lecture uh, for your year. We are going to be looking this, uh, this week at chapter 11, and we're going to be looking at it all at one time. Um, so all of chapter 11 is here for you, talking about momentum and collisions. And this is something that you covered in physical science, so much of this should be a remembering event, not necessarily a learning event. And I hope that that is true for you. As always, if you have any questions, please post them in the comments field below and uh, we will address those as soon as we can. So let's dive right into it. Momentum and collisions. Uh, momentum is the measure of an object's inertia of motion. So we talked about inertia already. Um, inertia is the tendency that an object has when it is in motion to remain in motion, and if it's at rest, to remain at rest. And if you want to quantify um, the idea of inertia, you need to do that using the idea of momentum or using the term momentum. So momentum is a quantification of inertia, okay? They, they are synonyms except that one has an equation. So uh, momentum is abbreviated with the lowercase p. Don't know why. I guess they ran out of other letters. Momentum has a 10 word p. I mean, he's not in the word momentum. There you go. You understood what I meant. Um, but that's what they use. So get used to it. Momentum is p. Um, so P equals the mass of an object times its velocity. Notice how similar that is to the concept of kinetic energy, right? Kinetic energy is mass times the velocity squared. So this is uh, just a little bit different than kinetic energy, but you'll see um, as we start to play with this idea later on in class that as kinetic energy goes, so goes momentum. Um, so we can, we can be playing with those two ideas together. Uh, we express this with the unit kilogram meters per second not newtons. A newton is a, uh, is a kilogram meters per second squared. Notice it's very, very similar to a newton, but it's not a newton. Um, so kilogram meters per second is the unit. We don't have another name for that. We just leave it as kilogram meters per second. Okay. Um, since mass is usually constant, um, an object doesn't tend to gain or lose weight as it's going down the road very much. Um, the, the a change in momentum is usually because of a change in velocity. Now, if you're talking about an automobile, I fill up my tank with 18 gallons of gas and I drive about 300 miles. And at the end of those 300 miles, my car is slightly less massive because I have used the 16, 18 gallons of gas that were in the tank. So my car loses weight as it drives, but not very many objects that we are gonna deal with in physics do that. So. Uh, most of the time, if you have a change in momentum, it's because of a change in velocity. Now, keep in mind that it's a change in velocity, not necessarily speed. Velocity is a, is a vector. So we could just turn a corner and have, a, and have changed our momentum, okay, because our velocity is now facing a different direction. So um, the, uh, the, there is a force required to change momentum, um, and the force required is applied, uh, the, if the force to change momentum is congruent to the change in momentum divided by unit time. So if you apply a certain force to an object that is in motion, you will change its momentum uh, over a certain amount of time. And interestingly, this is the original way that Newton expressed um, the, uh, the mother equation, F equals ma. We have rearranged this to be F equals ma, but this is actually how he looked at it was force was the ability to change inertia, the ability to change momentum in a certain unit of time, okay? So that's, a, that's another important equation to have. So let's look at this real quick. Um, both of these are, are experiencing a change in momentum. This girl going down the inner tube um, on the snowy slopes there, in case you've never seen this before, this is snow, for those of you who live in Hawaii, okay. Um, She's going down the snowy slopes on an inner tube, and she is accelerating because gravity is pulling on her. So here, the force changing her momentum is gravity, and the, uh, the component of gravity that is parallel with this track is um, accelerating her down the track, okay? So she's experiencing a change in momentum because of the force. This racing truck is also experiencing a change in momentum because of a force. Now here, the force is the centripetal force caused by the fact that the truck is turning. Um, it is probably also slowing down, so it's probably also experiencing a change in, its, uh, in the magnitude of its velocity. But more importantly for this illustration, it's experiencing a change in the direction of its velocity, and the force 
causing that is the centripetal force on the turn, and so that is also the force causing a change in momentum. Alrighty. So um, momentum is uh, is changed by a force. We already said that. The longer that the force is applied to an object with momentum, the more that that object's momentum changes. And so we use a word to talk about how long the force was applied. Um, and that is the idea of impulse, okay? So impulse is the measurement of an applied, an applied force and the time it has to act on an object. So if you apply a force of, let's say, 20 newtons, but you only apply it for half a second, you're not going to accomplish as much changing momentum as if you were to apply that, 100, that 20 newton force for 100 seconds, okay? The longer you push on something, the more of a difference you're going to make, okay? So impulse, I, impulse, is the force times how long it's going to be applied. You could also look at it and say that the net change in momentum is because of impulse, okay? And so because both these are equal to impulse, if, you, if it were helpful, you could also say that a force times a unit of time gives you the degree of change of momentum. Okay, so you can do a lot of things with this. The first example that came to my mind is actually the two kinds of 38 special that you can buy. The short barrel, the snub nose 38 special, and then you can buy 38 specials with very long barrels. Now, um, this is the kind of gun that uh, somebody who's into personal defense might conceal and carry in their purse or under their shirt. Uh, you can't conceal this. It's a monster and everybody's gonna know you have it. But the benefit to this kind of gun. It's the same ammunition. It's still a 38 special. But when you chamber the round here and you fire it, the, the round is only going to experience the acceleration of the powder for this far. Because as soon as the round leaves the barrel, all the gases escape around the side, and the, the bullet is going to be, at that point, slowing down because of friction, not speeding up anymore. It's only going to speed up this distance. Whereas when you put the same round in this chamber and you fire it, the round is going to experience the expa expansion of the gases for a whole lot longer. Okay, this is a 13-inch barrel. This is a 2-inch barrel. 2-inch barrel, easy to conceal, slow-moving bullet. 13-inch barrel, very hard to conceal, uh, very fast-moving bullet. So uh, depending on what your, your intentions are with the handgun, um, you know, you get very, very different results with these two weapons. Uh, interestingly, I was into potato cannons growing up, and my friend made a potato cannon with a two-foot barrel, and he was all impressed because he could shoot a potato like, you know, I don't know, let's say 60 yards. Um, and that was really cool. We played with that for a long time, and then um, I took physics. And in high school, I learned that the longer the impulse is allowed to act on the, the projectile, the faster the projectile goes because it's experiencing the force longer. So I made a new potato cannon for us to play with with an eight-foot barrel. It was very hard to aim, but man, that potato flew. I got 300 yards out of a potato, which is astounding. Um, and the only difference was the length of the barrel. So um, that's just another example. Impulse, the longer you apply the force to something, the more of a change in momentum you're going to get. Okay, Conservation of momentum. Momentum is always conserved in collisions. So object one hits object two, and the momentum that object one had and the momentum that object two had can both be found in the resulting um, behavior of those two objects. Momentum is always, always conserved. Okay. Kinetic energy is not always conserved, and we're going to see some examples of that. So if, uh, if in a collision you can track all the momentum in the way things fly apart after the, the collision, uh, but you can't track all of the kinetic energy, then some of the kinetic energy is turned into some other form of energy, and, uh, and those collisions are a little bit different. So we have three different kinds of terminology we use for collisions. All of them, again, conserve momentum. Some of them conserve kinetic energy. An elastic collision, kinetic energy is conserved. Okay, you can find all the kinetic energy present in uh, in all the way things ricochet after the collision that you were able to find at the beginning. Partially elastic collisions is where you can find most of the kinetic energy still as kinetic energy in the objects as they bounce apart from each other from the collision. But 
some of the kinetic energy has been lost. And this is usually because some of the objects got deformed or bent um, when they ran into each other. So some of the energy went into transforming the shape of the objects. Okay, um, But there's also inelastic collisions where kinetic energy is not conserved at all. You, you have a totally different value for kinetic energy afterwards. That's usually when things hit and stick. Okay, So let's look at some pictures to help you with this. Um, billiard balls is a great example of kinetic energy being conserved. The kinetic energy that was present in the cue ball um, is now able to be found in all of the motion of the cue balls, or sorry, of the billiard balls as they ricochet around the table. The cue ball had the most kinetic energy in it. It gave its kinetic energy to these other balls. So if you measure the kinetic energy still present in the cue ball and the kinetic energy present in all these other ones that are moving, you could add it all together and see that it's the same amount of kinetic energy and the collision was elastic. Now, momentum is always conserved. I'm going to say that a hundred times. No matter if you can find all the kinetic energy, you can find all the momentum. Momentum is always conserved. Okay. Here's an example of a semi-elastic collision. These cars went bang and they are still definitely in motion. This car has, uh, is still going pretty fast along the track. This car is still going fast, although it's going to, be bad pretty soon. Um, but if you were to add up the kinetic energy of this vehicle and the kinetic energy of this vehicle, you would not find all of the kinetic energy that was once in the system because some of it has gone into deforming the front part of this car and I'm sure deform deforming the bumper of this car and uh, that kinetic energy, some of it's being absorbed by the brakes here and by this metal dragging on the ground. So the kinetic energy is going away, but not all of it. Um, we still have a lot of kinetic energy, just not all of the kinetic energy we used to have. This is a semi-elastic, okay? And sometimes it's called imperfectly elastic, Already, This, a football tackle, is an example of an inelastic collision because uh, you had one guy running one way, one guy running another way. They run into each other and they stick together because the one guy grabbed the other and they fall to the ground. And you can still find the net momentum, but you can't find all the kinetic energy. Kinetic energy of these two together is entirely different than the kinetic energy of them separate. And then once they hit the ground, obviously, the kinetic energy has been completely transformed into potential. Okay? So that's, uh, that's just an example of those three kinds of energy. Now, some math. Physics wouldn't be physics without math. Um, elastic collisions can be solved with a pair of equations. And these pairs of equations are only good when one object was standing still before it was struck with the other one. The uh, kinds of equations you need when both objects were in motion are not going to be something we deal with this, at this level of physics. But here we have object one, okay, and the, the final velocity, velocity prime, the final velocity of object one is the mass of object one minus the mass of object two divided by the mass of object one plus the mass of object two. So you're looking at the difference in the sum of the masses, and then you divide those, okay? Times the initial velocity of object one. Now notice that this is V1 and this is V1 prime. The difference being this is final velocity, this is initial velocity. And then here we have uh, the way to find the final velocity of object two. This is the final velocity of object two, it's twice the mass of object 1 divided by the sum of the masses times the initial velocity of object 1. Notice, again, in this equation, velocity 1, velocity 2. Why don't you use velocity 2 over here? Well, because this is where uh, object 2 was at rest. So object 2 does not have initial velocity. It only has final velocity. Okay? So let's play with those equations. All right. So here we have one of those awesome little toys that you see on people's desks where one mass comes in and hits a, a series of masses and this one goes flying out. So mass 2 is my end over here. He's currently not moving. He has a mass of 5 grams. This is mass number 1. He also has a mass of 5 grams and he is moving at 3 meters per second. Okay, 3 meters per second comes in and goes whack and we're going to see what happens here and what happens here after the collision. And if you've seen this toy, you know the answer, but now you're going to see why. Okay. So there's my pair of, of equations that I'm going to use. Velocity 1 is the difference of the masses divided by the sum of the masses times the initial velocity of 1. So velocity of 1 final is 5 grams minus 5 grams 
divided by five grams plus five grams times three, because the initial velocity was three and the initial mass was five grams, or the mass is five grams, okay? So five minus five is zero. Ah, well that makes this a lot easier. Zero divided by anything is zero. Zero times anything is zero. So the final velocity of mass one is zero and mass one stops, okay? And you've seen that in the toy, right? It comes down and goes click and sits there. And that's why. Now here, this one gets to move. So velocity of two final is twice the mass of one divided by the sum of the masses times the initial velocity of one. So twice five grams is 10. Five plus five is also 10. 10 divided by 10 is one. 1 times 3 is 3. So mass 2 moves away at the same velocity with which it was initially struck. This is 3 meters per second. This is 3 meters per second. Okay? And that's why this toy goes on for a long time, is because the velocity and the kinetic energy is conserved. Um, the kinetic energy of this mass is exactly the same as the kinetic energy of this mass. Now, this is ignoring friction, and in the real world, there's friction, and eventually the balls stop. But they go for a long time. Okay? If you need to see that again, replay the example. And again, feel free to post any questions. So, now, those were examples of things with equal mass. What happens when things don't have equal mass? Well, it obviously behaves differently, but the same equations apply. Here we have uh, an object with very little mass getting struck by an object with a lot of mass, this baseball player is one big system, right? And so it whacks this thing, and that's why the little ball goes bye-bye. He flies away very, very, very fast because um, he is getting hit by all of this momentum, and that momentum gets transferred into the little tiny ball, and off it goes, right? Um, here we have an object that is much more massive than the car, and the car is being struck by the train, and thankfully this was a, a, a test, and there's no human in the, train, in the car. This was a test of what would happen, and there you see what happens. Um, the car gets mangled, uh, and that's because much less mass gets struck with a whole stinking lot of momentum, and the momentum gets transferred into this little object, and it goes bye-bye. Same kind of thing here. If this little boy and the sumo wrestler were to, wrestler were to collide with each other, uh, the little boy would lose because there's a lot more momentum here, and that momentum is gonna win the day. And so the system is gonna move that direction, all right? So, inelastic collisions now, different set of equations. The equations that we looked at with elastic collisions um, were where all of the kinetic energy can be found afterwards. This is where we have uh, situations where not all of the kinetic energy can be found afterwards, and you wanna see What's the momentum of the resulting equation? So here again, we have mass one colliding with a resting mass two. That's all the kinds of equations you're gonna get at this level of physics. So mass two is sitting still, mass one whacks it. Um, and now they stick together. So this is more like the football players than like the baseball, okay? Um, mass one times velocity of one equals the sum of the masses times the resulting final velocity. Then notice this is in velocity one or two because they, they're stuck together. So it's just the resulting velocity of the system. So if collisions happen in two dimensions, we need to analyze the x and the y components separately and we'll get to do that in class, where you're gonna be doing this with sub x for everything and then you're gonna be doing it for sub y for everything and then you're gonna add the x and y together to get your resultant. But uh, we're not gonna do that in the lecture, we'll just do that in class. Okay, so here we go. Inelastic collision, two sumo wrestlers. Yay, that's just, yeah, a good thing it's not lunch right now. So these two dudes run into each other um, and the mass of person number one is 155 kilograms, the person number, sorry, person number two is 155 kilograms, person one is 163 kilograms. I numbered them this way because this guy ran into this guy. He was at rest, he's the one moving. Um, and initially the velocity of person two is zero. Velocity of person one is negative four meters per second. Why negative? Well, because in my coordinate system, X goes positive this direction. This guy's going this way, so negative. Mass one times velocity one equals the sum of the masses times the final velocity. So mass one times velocity one, 163 kilogram dude, velocity one, negative four meters per second equals the sum of the masses, 155 plus 163, 
times my final velocity, which I don't know. Uh, these two numbers multiplied together is negative 652. And then the uh, sum here of their masses is 313 kilograms. I just need to solve for V prime, okay? So I'm gonna divide both sides by 313. I get V prime is negative 2.0830 meters per second. Correct for my significant digits, I have three, three, two, two, two is the answer that I should use. So 2.1 is my corrected for significant digits. The collision will result in the wrestlers together going left at 2.1 meters per second because of the negative sign there. Okay, almost done, one last idea. Uh, angular momentum. Uh, just like in circular motion, there's angular speed, there's angular acceleration, there's angular velocity. There can be angular momentum. So we calculate it, oh, we use capital L for angular momentum. Again, P is momentum and L is angular momentum. Don't know why, but there you go. Uh, capital L equals the mass of the object that is rotating times the square of its radius from the center of rotation times its angular velocity, which is omega, remember from a couple of lectures back. So we'll use that real quick here. What is the angular momentum of the moon? Alrighty, um, momentum, remember, is just mass times velocity. And here you see that that's basically meant the same thing because tangential velocity is the radius and the angular velocity. So we're just sticking in, instead of V, we're putting R squared omega in for that. Um, so it's basically the same equation, right? What's the angular momentum of the moon? The mass of the moon is 7.34767E22, meaning times 10 to the 22nd power, okay? The radius, the center of mass to the center of mass from the Earth to the moon is 3.8 times 10 to the 8th meters. It's very, very far. Angular velocity of the moon's orbit is 2.66 times 10 to the negative 6th radians per second, okay? So we're gonna plug all that in, mass, radius, angular velocity. Mass, radius, angular velocity. All you have to do is square the radius first, right? So we're gonna take care of that, and we get 1.44 times 10 to the 17th meters squared. Now we just multiply straight across, and we get 2.822269 times 10 to the 34th kilogram meters squared per second. And then uh, the the uh, unit that we leave it in is this kilogram meters per second squared. Sorry, yes, meters squared per second. There you go. Um, and so that is 2.8 times 10 to the 34th. I just need to correct my significant digits from here, right? So um, that's the way you can find angular momentum of an object that is in rotation. All righty, let me know if you have any questions. Post them in the comments field below, and I'll see you tomorrow in class. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.